Hey, good day, everybody, and welcome to your Ruby Live event. My name is Eric Weinkoop, and I'm the Director of Culinary Instruction here at Ruby. And I'm also one of your chef instructors, along with my other teammates here. And it's my pleasure today to uh, host my office hours. And this is your chance to ask questions about food and cooking. And I'll do my best to come up with a response, uh, or a couple of them. Uh, that'll be meaningful for you and your situation. Uh, I'm, I've got a couple of items I want to mention as, as we get started. And the first one is that um, uh, if you would like to participate more directly in today's program by sharing a question or even a comment, uh, you're welcome to do so by entering that into the dialog box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. And that'll make its way to the queue of uh, the, the gray boxes on the right-hand side of your screen. And um, also, as you, you know, uh, come up with a, a question that, um, uh, you know, that, that's been nagging you for a while, hopefully it's one that really is focused on food and cooking, uh, rather than straying into medicine and um, other allied topics that are outside of the scope of uh, our focus here today. All right. And then the second thing I'll mention is that uh, within each question box uh, in the gray column on the right hand side, uh, you'll see a heart shaped icon. And if you would like that question answered sooner than later, you can click on that icon and it'll push it up in priority. All right. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and start with today's program. So the, uh, the first question uh, reads, I am really interested in maintaining an SOS lifestyle. So this is a uh, salt, oil, and sugar-free lifestyle. Uh, what herbs do you recommend that can lift the flavor as a salt replacement? Uh, I do use fresh lemon juice, but sometimes I need a little something more. This is from Donita. Thank you very much. Uh, this is an interesting question, and uh, this is all about flavor development. And uh, this is where skill development and also your expanding knowledge base uh, will come into play to, you know, inform sort of that path that you carve out with uh, different preparations, different dishes that you might enjoy making. And um, so... Uh, you ask about herbs, and I'm going to expand that a bit to herbs and spices, and then also include a nod toward your choice of cooking method, okay? Uh, so, you know, regarding herbs and spices, my, my first response is to use more of them. And uh, I'll, I'll share a couple of suggestions for you to consider um, in terms of places to start. And the first is that uh, you might look at a commercially available product like a Mrs. Dash's uh, seasoning. And uh, look at the ingredient list just to get an idea of what they're using and the variety, just how much uh, uh, of these different ingredients that they're packing into uh, a couple of shakes of their seasoning. And you can start to mimic some of those ingredients at home and, um, you know, typically I recommend fresh herbs, uh, although if you want to add them early in the process and, and expose them to a longer cooking period, then uh, certainly a dry product would be fine. Um, if you're reaching for dry herbs, I generally recommend the more sort of robust flavored herbs, the hearty herbs like uh, rosemary and thyme and uh, savory, for example, uh, because the more delicate flavored herbs like cilantro and parsley lose most of their flavor through the drying process. And so I definitely recommend using those herbs fresh. And, uh, you know, very often they will uh, be added toward the end of the cooking process or just prior to service in order to uh, preserve those uh, volatile oils and more delicate aromas, okay? Uh, another uh, suggestion 
that I want to share with you is to start to look at the cuisines of the world, okay? And uh, look at different flavor combinations um, that characterize regional cuisines and start to practice with those combinations. And you're going to find, uh, you know, these regional profiles that appeal to you. And then also uh, you'll, you'll begin to uh, better understand specifically what spices, usually spices primarily, and then secondarily herbs come together uh, in a very nice way with other ingredients. Okay. Uh, and then it's going to be practice and experimentation on your part that will refine that ideal sort of um, uh, combination for you based upon the dish that you might prepare. And uh, another consideration is the cooking method and uh, the dry heat cooking methods. So sauteing and grilling, for example, uh, are going to impart browning. And uh, that browning uh, works um, uh, on the sugars as well as the proteins that uh, would be present uh, in the foods. And uh, this could be uh, refer this could refer to the spices as well if you caramelize uh, or toast spices, but that brings out aroma, and aroma equals flavor. And so you're going to bring this uh, this depth of flavor. Uh, sometimes we think of it as uh, an additional layer of flavor. Uh, sometimes we might refer to it as a full round uh, flavor. And uh, all of that contributes to more satisfaction on the palate. And uh, so somewhere in there, I think, is going to be, you know, the, the, the combination of things that are going to help you uh, with respect to herbs and uh, herbs and spices. Uh, and then, you know, also keep in mind uh, uh, other acidulants. Now, you mentioned lemon juice. Uh, consider lime juice. I mean, lime has got uh, acidity, uh, but it also has a different f accompanying flavor than lemon juice. And then we can you know, talk about all the other members of the citrus fruit family, as well as other acids uh, and vinegars come to mind. And uh, again, vinegars uh, are going to uh, uh, um, provide acidity to the food, which uh, lightens heavier foods and heavier flavors. It lightens them on the palate. I, I have always described the, the addition of acidity as, uh, you know, enticing the food to dance on your tongue, to dance on your palate. Um, so think about uh, vinegar, but also uh, not just the acidity, but the accompanying flavor, because each vinegar is going to be a little bit different in that respect. And so think about what might pair best with your dish. Uh, and then a couple of other thoughts uh, regarding vinegar. Uh, is that some have a sharper acidity than others. Um, uh, on, on the more delicate side is going to be rice vinegar. Uh, so it's a, a very a very common one if you want um, just a, a sort of a, a smoother experience with rounded edges, uh, just a, a, a way to try to have, uh, explain that. But um, So try out those different categories of ingredients and then also think about your choice of cooking method and as again, as those come together, I think you're going to find more enjoyable food. Thank you. Uh, next up uh, is a question from Candy. Uh, I have a rice, mushroom, and spinach loaf I make that uses four eggs. Uh, what can I swap out for the eggs, and will it change the texture of the loaf? Um, so, you know, the, the common replacement for eggs will be a commercial egg replacer. Uh, also, uh, you, you will find recipes that call for uh, these sticky um, ingredients like um, chia seeds or flax seeds. Those are going to be the most uh, common. Um, and uh, so you're going to you know, bring in uh, these items uh, and, and their stickiness will help as a binder. And um, very often in a, in a vegetable loaf, the egg... Uh, it, primarily the egg white functions as a binder to hold all of this together. Now the egg yolk uh, provides a lot of fat and flavor and um, you know with that comes moisture. So um, you might think of um, another way to introduce the the moisture component um, if 
you feel that's necessary. That, that could be a touch of fat, if, if that's okay with you, uh, or it could be a vegetable or fruit puree. Um, so if, if you already are working with, um, you know, certain uh, savory items like the rice and beans, um, you know, maybe you add a different legume, maybe a, a lentil puree. Uh, it could be a chickpea flour uh, that also acts as a, as a, as a binder, uh, but that's going to uh, still require some, some additional liquid. Um, apple sauce um, can also act as a, um, a, a, source, a source of moisture. So um, uh, again, flaxseed, chia, commercial egg replacer, and then kind of in the mix here just a second ago, I, I mentioned um, a chickpea flour, um, which I, I should qualify as really being uh, a binder. And um, so these other legume powders, uh, as well as grain powders, can be used as a binder, um, which uh, can, can replace egg to, to some extent. So, you know, eggs are, are unique. Um, and in fact, many of these uh, um, uh, uh, sort of dairy variations, as well as uh, eggs, you know, in the conventional kitchen, they've got multiple... Um, functions kind of rolled into a single ingredient. So as we go to replace uh, that single ingredient, for example, an egg, we need to consider the multiple functions that um, it could provide to the item that you're making. Okay. Um, but, but give that a try and uh, always keep in mind that some experimentation may be necessary on your part uh, to find the amounts uh, of, of a given ingredient that are going to best suit your desired outcome. Thank you. All right, and uh, the next question. Uh, what can I do uh, to better work with herbs and spices? Okay, great, another uh, herb and spice question. I like depth of flavor in my food and usually toast herbs and spices before adding them to a dish. Is there anything else I can do to create more concentrated flavor in my food? Um, so I'm gonna... Um, uh, sort of reference the earlier question for the for the bulk of the response to this question. But um, um, I, I think you're on the right track, right, in terms of toasting, especially spices. Um, you know, be careful with herbs be, uh, in terms of um, toasting them or exposing them to uh, excessive heat because what gives us the aroma from herbs are these more delicate, uh, these, these volatile aromatic compounds, and uh, they tend to evaporate uh, when exposed to air, and that's hastened when that air is hot. Um, so, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I typically recommend using fresh herbs because you've got uh, those volatile compounds concentrated, and um, add them late in the cooking process or just prior to service. Um, you know, in order to maximize that aroma that uh, you get to enjoy at the table because aroma equals flavor. Now, uh, again, just to reiterate uh, an earlier comment, if it's <clears throat> a more robust herb like rosemary, then perhaps you can add that earlier in the cooking process um, so that it's not too strong uh, at service time. Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, yes, you know, regarding spices, uh, they can certainly be handled in different ways. They can be uh, kept whole or they can be ground. Um, they can be um, uh, added early in the process. They can add, be added late in the cooking process. And often both are, uh, uh, approaches are used. Uh, and they can be toasted dry or toasted, or um, I'll say toasted or fried in a little bit of oil uh, to bring out uh, those aromas. Um, very often a dish will be finished uh, with spices that are toasted because those are again, very fresh um, uh, aromas and flavors that we can then enjoy at service time. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, otherwise, uh, start to use uh, a, a wider variety of herbs and spices in combination. 
and um, start to increase the quantity a little bit to see how you like those combinations along with the main ingredients that you're preparing, okay? And uh, again, just to uh, reiterate uh, my global focus, um, reach out and, and experiment with spice blends from different parts of the world. Um, and uh, you know, you're gonna find that uh, these combinations of uh, herbs and spices are tested, right? They're tried and true favorites of a lot of people from a given region and uh, you might enjoy it too. And so I, I recommend, uh, you know, those approaches. Thank you. And the next question from Monica, how can I make crispy vegan cookies without the use of added fat or oil? Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, in conventional baking, uh, oil, uh, you know, can, uh, definitely add a, uh, a crispy characteristic to cookies. So in the absence of oil, then the uh, ingredients that lend a chewy characteristic uh, tend to stand out. And so here, what we can do, I think of a, of a couple of things, you know, one would be to um, make cookies that are a little bit thinner uh, and then also just bake them a little bit longer in order to draw out more moisture, which will result in a little bit more crispiness. Um, now, as we draw out the, the baking time, we might need to decrease the temperature to avoid burning, especially if you try to roll out certain cookies a little bit thinner because you're going to expose uh, those more delicate edges uh, to the heat, um, especially if it's high heat, uh, there's a good chance they're going to uh, brown excessively, creating some bitterness uh, or worst case scenario to, to really burn. So um, you, again, experimentation uh, on your part will be necessary. Um, I always recommend taking notes so that you can replicate success and uh, avoid those uh, results that you didn't like so well, okay? Uh, give those couple of approaches a try and see what you come up with. Thank you. All right, next up. Uh, when I use a simple recipe for a burger made of beans and rice, the finished product always falls apart too easily. Should I use an egg replacer like chia or flaxseed, or should I bake the burgers longer or at a higher temperature? Um, so yes, when we make plant-based burgers with whole food, okay, so I'm not talking about these, um, you know, high tech, um, burgers that, uh, really mimic ground beef, but, uh, rather whole food based, um, burger patties, uh, in this case, uh, you know, beans and rice would be a, a perfect example. Um, they tend to be crumbly. And uh, so, so n number one, kind of keep in mind that they are soft uh, in their finished state and they, they tend to be more delicate because they just don't have that strong binding effect that animal protein gives a meat patty, okay? Um, but uh, what we are talking about is the binder. And uh, so you can certainly start out with something like uh, ground flax seed or chia seed um, to, to give some of that stickiness. Uh, and then you can also consider something like uh, a ground legume flour and uh, chickpea flour uh, called basin uh, is readily available in Indian or other South Asian grocery stores. And um, that would be a strong suggestion as well. And keep it in mind that uh, these legume powders like chickpea flour will lend some flavor and uh, you need to moderate that so that um, uh, it's suitable for, for your palate, okay? And sometimes that's very simply uh, using less of it um, or using more herbs and spices to find that balance, okay? Thank you. Uh, oh, second part of your question, excuse me, Roy. Uh, regarding the temperature, um, you know, I don't necessarily recommend uh, increasing the temperature because that will dry out the patty and cause more crumbling, at least around the edges, okay? Um, so maintain the same temp, uh, same time. So all the, the only variable you're working with is gonna be the binder, 
okay, and then see how that uh, works for you. Thank you. Hello, Kathy. Uh, Kathy says, I am looking for a low-fat plant-based substitute for evaporated canned milk. Many recipes substitute canned coconut milk or plant-based half and half. Both are high in fat and give everything a coconut flavor. Uh, are there any alternatives? Um, so, you know, the, the quick answer here would be to use a, a powdered plant milk. And uh, you can uh, uh, find products like um, um, oat-based products, um, and, and there are others, uh, that you can then mix with water uh, to create a plant-based milk. But you can adjust that that consistency in terms of the, the 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 flavor intensity, for example, even the viscosity to a certain extent, um, and so that might be your best uh, approach to this particular situation. Uh, and then you know, with a, a product like that, uh, you know, you can uh, take it in a savory or sweet direction, of course, um, um, by adding a a favorite sweetener of yours. Um, often a a liquid sweetener works well with these liquid-based products. Okay, thank you. All right, and uh, good to see Mitch. Uh, Mitch says, can you recommend the best way to clean mushrooms? Um, well, you know, I can uh, talk about a couple of ways to, to clean mushrooms. I, I'll uh, kind of leave it to the cook to determine what feels best, okay? Um, you know, one is to use a brush. And uh, there are mushroom brushes, which are just, uh, it almost looks like a little a little handheld brush that the umpire uses to sweep off home plate every once in a while. But um, uh, or maybe a little bit smaller, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a brush that, um, a delicate brush really, that um, uh, will uh, remove um, pine needles and a little bits of moss and, and things that um, often might st uh, stick to um, herbs. And I'm, I'm kind of painting the scenario of foraging, but, um, you know, even uh, cultivated mushrooms that might be grown in a, in a, a grassy, woody sort of uh, a material um, can often be removed with a brush like this. Okay, so that's going to be one way that uh, some cooks approach this question. And then uh, the other is to run the mushrooms under some water, just a, a light stream of water working as quickly as you can uh, to, to, to rub the, the surface as needed uh, to remove whatever it is that needs to be removed, okay? And I suggest moving quickly uh, because there are some mushrooms that will draw in the water and become a little bit waterlogged in terms of the, uh, the, the flavor and the texture. Uh, there are some mushrooms that will start to discolor you know, for example, white mushrooms start to take on a pink sort of a look. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it at that point. It's just, um, it's just what they do. And, uh, you know, you can certainly move forth with cooking. Um, but uh, if, if you move uh, quickly, then you can, you know, minimize uh, some of that. But um, those are the two ways to do that. I don't see uh, anything wrong with either one of those. I have used both with, uh, with uh, very good results. Um, so please give them a try and see what might be best for your situation. Thank you. Uh, let's see. And uh, next question uh, again for Mitch. Uh, is aquafaba from a can of chickpeas the same as the soaking water for fresh chickpeas? Uh, also, is aquafaba only from chickpeas or do other canned beans produce it as well? Excellent question. So uh, the first one, uh, the aquafaba from canned beans, canned um, chickpeas in this case, uh, is more concentrated than you're going to find your soaking water or, or cooking water to be, okay? Um, but the nice thing with aquafaba is that you can take that, um, that uh, the residual cooking water from your chickpeas um, after you strain the, the, the beans out and then just reduce it uh, to concentrate um, all of those starches in there. And, um, you know, you can uh, create an aquafaba 
that will mimic what you get from the can. And then the, uh, the second part is um, uh, aquafaba it can be produced from any beans. Okay. And um, it, uh, it j j just means uh, bean water. Um, now keep in mind that if you're using the, the cooking water from a dark colored bean, say black beans, then you're going to get an aquafaba that is kind of dingy gray in color. Uh, and so think about your application and whether that's going to be suitable or not. Okay. Thank you. And the next question, uh, where do you recommend going to find cooking utensils and supplies? Okay. Uh, you know, the, the first thing that always comes to mind for me, I guess, um, because I, I come from the restaurant industry, uh, is to go to a, a local cash and carry sort of a restaurant supply store. And, and they go by different names. Um, there is a chain of these stores um, in, in the Northwest anyway, uh, Washington and Oregon, for example, that go by the name of Chef's Store. And um, they were originally established uh, to serve small restaurant owners who um, don't want or really don't qualify uh, for an account with one of the large distributors. And um, these stores are also open to the public. And now they, they carry everything that a restaurant would, would use. And uh, so you're going to find some, uh, you know, some things that have more of a, um, a, you know, utilitarian sort of a look to them than a, a polished home look, but they're very functional, of course. And the, this is the, the sort of place that I direct uh, people to first. Um, now, beyond that, there are many other stores, right? Whether it's a Sur La Table or a Bed, Bed Bath & Beyond or... Um, uh, sometimes it's a, a discount um, household furnishing store. It could even be a place like uh, Goodwill. Um, all of these places, uh, Costco comes to mind. Okay, but all these places will have, um, you know, cooking utensils and, and supplies and, and equipment um, in, in one form or another at one time or another, right? Especially these places that... Um, uh, or uh, the, the inventories of which are based on donation, okay? But uh, check out these places and, um, you know, think about what it is that you want and then just sort of uh, kind of keep an eagle eye out for those items. Now, some of this, of course, also depends upon your budget. Um, if a person has uh, deep pockets, then you know, go, go down to the mall or someplace and, and find a, a, a place, you know, like, a, like the Calphalon store or, or whatever it happens to be your all clad store. And, and, um, uh, or maybe it's going to be a, a full on copper, uh, cookware set, whatever it is that appeals to you, you're going to find some good quality. Uh, now if you're on a smaller budget or a budget of some sort, then, then it becomes fun and interesting to me. Uh, because you need to be a little more savvy, a little more patient, and um, uh, you need to know what you're after um, by doing a little bit more research um, to, to, to see what characteristics and just what uh, products that uh, you might hone in on. Okay, uh, but those are some places to start with, and um, you might find some equivalents online as well. Um, you know, as a, as a starting place in terms of um, you know, I guess expanding one's vocabulary and looking at photographs, you might take a look at, um, um, uh, you know, th these online restaurant supply stores. And that's a great place for an education. Thank you. All right. And uh, next question. Uh, I currently use maple syrup as a sweetener, uh, but is there another sweetener that is prefer preferred as a healthier alternative? Uh, also, instead of using brown sugar, what would you suggest? Um, well, th yeah, this is an interesting question. Um, you know, uh, w when we talk about sugar and sweeteners and healthy, um, I... I often hesitate um, or, or, or maybe sort of, I guess, question uh, where we're going with this because 
we should be, I think, moderating uh, sweeteners, uh, first of all, uh, you know, and then there's often uh, not a concern, right, as to which one we use, so long as uh, maybe we focus on something, th something that's um, uh, a little bit closer to its um, natural state. Um, so something brown, for example, uh, is going to contain all the minerals and molasses and, and uh, what otherwise might be considered impurities, right, from the white sugar perspective. OK. And uh, so, you know, uh, maple syrup uh, is an example that comes to mind. I know you mentioned that as one that you want to uh, avoid, but um, uh, also think about other plant based uh, syrups like agave syrup. Um, think about other um, whole, I'll call them whole sugars, um, but those sugars that are more intact, right? In, again, in terms of having the minerals and um, all the, the molasses and things uh, present. Um, so brown sugar is an example. Um, uh, Piloncillo uh, from Mexico, um, Jaggery from India. Uh, there are uh, many, many examples from different regions uh, uh, around the world that would sort of fit this uh, category, I think, that, that you're thinking about. And um, those hard sugars can also be dissolved in some water over heat to make a syrup. And um, so you've got some options there to make things like um, a piloncillo syrup. Uh, and so, so give those things a try. And um, if it's more specifically something like the, the, the ranking on the glycemic index that you're concerned with, then I would direct you to an online source to look at how some of these different um, products uh, compare to one another. But, you know, again, um, if we're talking about being healthy, then I'll stand up on my, on my soapbox for a moment here and, and suggest that you consider, um, you know, just, uh, you know, limiting overall uh, sugar intake, and um, then just leaning toward a sweetener that is a little bit closer to its original form, rather than highly refined like a white sugar. Thank you. All right, next up from Sarah. Uh, I just enrolled a few days ago. Can I just jump in? Or do I have to start at a specific time and follow a schedule? Sarah, go ahead and jump in. And, uh, you know, we recommend that you move through our courses in sequence, starting with task number one. And um, we, we have designed our courses with uh, some rhyme and reason, at least from our perspective. And so we think it makes sense that students start with task number one and then work in order toward the conclusion of the course. But otherwise, you are ready to go. And, you know, if you have... Uh, questions that are specific to your situation, you know, feel free to reach out to uh, us at support at ruby.com. And if you have a question that is specific to information on a task page, then you can uh, access the Q and A function at the bottom of each task page to ask a question. Thank you. All right, next question from Lorraine. Uh, what type of knives would you recommend for this course? Um, let's see, forks over knives. Okay. Um, so, you know, without being brand specific or recommending any particular manufacturer, um, I would recommend looking at the Victorinox uh, products and um, they have a, a, a line of cutlery called Fibrox. I think it's spelled F-I-B-R-O-X. And that line of cutlery um, provides, in my opinion, a good value. And uh, several years ago, it was also named a Best Buy by the folks at Consumer Reports, which um, I think was pretty cool. Um, but uh, the Victorinox, Victorinox, by the way, is the Swiss Army knife people, in, in case that sounds familiar to you. But the Victorinox Fibrox line of knives is nothing special. OK, um, they aren't handmade. Um, they're nothing to brag about to your family and friends, but they are utilitarian. Um, the blades are stamped steel. OK. Um, again, nothing special uh, from a, a, a manufacturing standpoint, but they provide a hardness 
um, that will hold its cutting edge for a reasonably long period of time, uh, yet the metal is soft enough that they're easy to sharpen when that time comes. And uh, the handles are a molded rubber. Again, nothing real interesting about that, but they're easy to clean and they last a really long time. And uh, you know, I've got all kinds of cutlery from handmade knives to your popular um, you know, store-bought brands. And I also have some Fibrox uh, knives that I use and uh, those are workhorses. That's my recommendation. Thank you. All right, next up, another question for Mitch. Uh, what is the best oil for wok cooking? I read that peanut oil is used by Chinese chefs and that a high smoke point is important. Would canola oil work? Um, so I think the high smoke point is going to be the most important thing. And um, yeah, historically, uh, peanut oil has been pretty popular among Chinese cooks. Uh, refined peanut oil has a pretty high smoke point. Um, I mean, these days there are other refined oils that um, have high smoke points. Um, avocado oil um, has a smoke point in the neighborhood of 500 degrees Fahrenheit, if I recall. Um, let's see, you ask about canola oil. Canola oil is, um, is a little bit less than that, but... Um, you know, give it a try, okay, and uh, see if it does the work that uh, that you want it to. And um, you know, keep in mind that you always have something like peanut oil or um, avocado oil to to lean on if uh, necessary. But um, the main thing is going to be a refined oil with a high smoke point. Okay, thank you. All right, the next question. Uh, hello, hello, Gabrielle. Uh, I keep making recipes like vegan curry, chili, and they're always so strong and acidic. How do I bring that down? Okay, so um, in order to uh, balance acidity uh, on the palate, we will reach for uh, a sweetener, okay? And then also uh, some sort of a creamy item. And that's where uh, you, you'll see uh, curries that will call for coconut milk, for example. Now, it doesn't have to be coconut milk, but other plant-based milks will function in a similar way, uh, where that creaminess will temper the acidity and uh, bring that more into balance. And it's going to be up to you to experiment and uh, to find the balance that works best for your particular palate as well as your audience, okay? Now, also, um, you know, you mentioned strong, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what that means. Um, but, you know, if you're talking about using, let's say... A, a curry paste that you buy at the store, you know, let's say, let's say a Thai curry paste, uh, those can be strong. And so the, the goal then will be to, to balance the quantity of that that you use. Okay, so in other words, cut, cut it back if needed from the base recipe uh, versus the uh, sort of tempering agent, right? That, uh, that plant-based milk, for example, that you might add to the curry uh, to, again, to bring some coolness uh, and some balance. Now, the next step here is to consider blending your own uh, pastes and uh, spice blends where you can start to omit particular ingredients that you find to be maybe too spicy, you know, for example, chili powders, okay? So you can have all of the flavors from the other, let's say, you know, 10 ingredients, uh, but you can omit or really decrease the quantity of chili powder if it's the heat that is too strong, okay? So that's just one example, but you can make those sort of adjustments if you start to make these products in your own kitchen, okay? And, um, uh, that's going to be true of acidity as well. Um, so it might depend on the tomatoes that you use or the vinegar that you might use for some of these dishes. Uh, you can 
change ingredients or you can decrease the quantity of that ingredient to uh, uh, you know, try to look for some balance. All right, thank you. All right, and Nicole writes, I'm looking for a good grab and go breakfast that will tide me over for many hours before I get a chance to take a break for lunch at work. Um, I don't like overnight oats. All right, excellent. So let's uh, expand the world beyond overnight uh, oats and, um, you know, take a look at things that provide fiber. So fiber uh, in a large way, or, you know, is going to come from fruits and vegetables as well as grains and beans or, you know, other legumes. And um, so, you know, if, um, if not oats, well, let, okay, let me um, also add another perspective here. Okay. Um, in the U S anyway, there is a, um, a custom uh, to eat something sweet for breakfast. And uh, if we go to the rest of the world, uh, while certainly many places have adopted these sort of Western influences of a, of a little sweet something in the morning, many places um, have had and still have a tradition of eating savory food for breakfast. And, you know, so it, it uh, you know, could be a savory oatmeal, um, but it, it could be uh, sauteed vegetables. Uh, you know, it, it could be, you know, something like um, a hearty bean salad. Um, you know, and, and if we think about fruits, um, you know, I would think about, um, uh, you know, eating whole fruits that you can chew and, um, you know, enjoy in that way. Uh, certainly, uh, I would not recommend a juice uh, because juices will lack the fiber that will uh, bring satiety and will kind of keep your hunger at bay for the, the duration of, of a long morning. OK, um, so uh, if, if you don't eat savory items for breakfast already, give it a try. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, keep an open mind and, and, you know, be willing to, you know, change the, uh, the, the, re the morning repertoire and, you know, these sorts of things in order to experience some of the new opportunities out there. Um, you know, I'll share with you my routine, you know, here at home, uh, at least Monday through Friday, um, I, I make miso soup and, um, uh, that's what uh, our son enjoys for breakfast, and then uh, you know all of us do later on in the morning. Um, but uh, you know that'll have uh, uh, plenty of vegetables, whatever's in the fridge, whatever's available, uh, and it sometimes includes uh, some rice. Sometimes it includes noodles. Uh, this morning it was uh, just a little batch of leftover rice noodles that I had. Uh, sometimes it's soba, right, buckwheat noodles that um, I'll add to the soup. Um, and then I'll add, uh, you know, usually it's miso, miso paste uh, to give it some depth and some umami for that um, satisfaction. Um, and then uh, you can add other things if you want. I'll sometimes add just a little dollop of uh, gochujang uh, to add another layer of flavor and some heat. Um, so there are uh, many different ways to uh, approach the breakfast plan. Uh, you know, if uh, your game to try out some some different ideas. All right, but think about fiber, uh, and don't be bashful about um, you know reaching for other legumes and other grains and plenty of fruits and vegetables. All right, thank you very much. And uh, let's see, Regina asks, so how often will you be doing the live Q and A? So. Um, my uh, open office, office hours uh, are provided once a month, and you know we have other instructors on our instructional team that will do open office hours, and so that uh, you know we we offer this sort of a format weekly, uh, and then there are other talks interspersed that are often topic specific, and uh, so please take a look at our website uh, to stay on top of the the upcoming schedule. But also know that if you uh, happen to miss a program, that you can always look at our archives uh, to enjoy past programs. All right. Um, and this brings us to the conclusion of the questions today. I want to thank each one of you for your attendance 
uh, and all of you that participated today. And um, please, um, you know, approach your kitchen and your meals with uh, a spirit of experimentation and, uh, you know, go forth and enjoy the process. So until we meet again, happy cooking.